how does somebody know when their grieving kind of extends beyond what's normal? What are the things that we should really be looking for? Like at that year point, what are those things that's like, hmm, we... So I like to be really careful that this is not actually recovery. This is like saying, when did you recover from your wedding day? <laughs> what? <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. Do you right. know what I mean? Right. And so the idea is this is an event that has happened that has permanently altered your life. And you will figure out how to make your life work even though that has happened or in addition to that having happened. And so I also like to point out there's nothing magic about a year. So we're really looking at change over time. We had to pick a time when we saw those diverge, but that's gonna look really different for everyone. Many people say the second year feels different, it feels worse, because now I know they're really gone. Now I've really gone through all those annual events. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your grieving, you're still seeing a change, and that's the important part. The things that make learning hard also make grieving hard, right? If grieving can be thought of as a form of learning. And one of those things is rumination. Now, rumination is those repetitive thoughts that just go round and round and round in your head, often very negative, very much focused on how you're feeling, why am I normal, why is this not getting better, what am I doing wrong, right? That sort of thought pattern. In grief specifically, there's a particular sort of flavor of rumination that is very common. It's very normal and typical early in grief, but for most of us, it declines. And these are the would've, should've, could've thoughts. All those infinite number of scenarios that our marvelous brain can come up with. And the infinite number of alternative scenarios they all end in, and then my loved one would have lived. But your loved one didn't live. And no amount of thinking up alternatives will change the world that you're living in. And the world that you're living in is the one that we have to figure out how to cope with, that we have to figure out how to make sense of and how to continue to do meaningful things despite the fact that you're going to have waves of grief. Rumination, part of the problem with rumination, is that it gets us into our head and out of the present moment that we're in. And the problem with that is, it's only in the present moment that really positive things can happen. Yes, the present moment has a lot of grief and sadness, and there's a lot of crying. But the present moment is also the only moment in which you can experience love or joy or creativity. Over time, we can develop a toolkit of what you do given that you are now a person who has waves of grief, right? So it can be totally appropriate to be like, you know what? Right now, I'm gonna cheer for my daughter's soccer game. I'm gonna pretend her father hasn't died. I'm not gonna to speak to any of the other parents if they ask me about it. I am gonna focus on cheering for her and that is what I'm doing right now. And that denial is totally an appropriate coping mechanism in that moment, right? So that's something you can pull out of your toolkit. If that's the only tool you have, you're probably gonna have some difficulties because it's gonna keep coming back. But you gotta use the whole set of tools to figure out how to deal with this thing that is happening. And I think developing those coping strategies, that's the agency. Your brain really is there to help you. It's going to take time. It is doing a lot in the background. That's why you can't concentrate on anything. It is trying to help you learn. And so if anything, if you can be patient as it is trying to figure out what's going on, and if you can encourage yourself to have new experiences, to allow your brain to see what is going on now, because it will take away the good information from that new experience. You know, we always hear it's like, it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And I, I do, like this appreciation for bonding yeah. and how important that is, because that's, it, it shouldn't, you know, I can see how people, they, they're afraid of being too close to people, and so yeah. they don't attempt. But this is the essence of our human existence, is this bonding. 
And so I just, I love it. I, I just, it's obviously, it's so important. Connectedness to people and to purpose is one of our big factors of brain health that we're always looking to measure. And it just it can't go, this it just is really reinforcing the importance of that because this is such a. And I think what's so interesting about it's better to have loved and lost because you have lost in the physical world, no doubt about it. You are not gonna have new experiences with this person. But your brain has not actually lost them that you do still carry around exactly how they would respond to you if you asked for advice, or exactly the way they would look at you when you did that ridiculous thing, right? Yeah. And so our brain really is still carrying them because we loved them.